Recently, there's been a lot of media coverage of the new travel advisory for the Bahamas and Jamaica issued by the US Department of State. And I've made a separate video to respond to this situation. If you haven't watched it, please check it out. With this episode, however, I'd like to take a closer look at the travel advisories in general. I mean, the entire system. I've looked at all US travel advisories ever produced for every single country. And what I've discovered is quite concerning. You see, the whole idea of travel advisories, their main goal and priority is to provide information to the US citizens to ensure their safety and security. But what if sometimes travel advisories provide misinformation and misguide US citizens with inaccurate data? How safe would it be for you to rely on the official misinformation when you have to make an important decision, especially in case of an emergency in a foreign country? The good news, I'm not the first one asking these questions. There has been academic research, including by American scientists, that highlights a wide range of issues with travel advisories. But for the purpose of this video, we shall focus on just the main ones, as well as on the good things. So next time when you're planning a trip, you take all of this into consideration to make a better informed decision. Travel advisories are not just issued by the United States. There are over 40 countries that do so on a regular basis. For instance, this is what travel advisories look like in Canada, the UK and Australia. A travel advisory is not the same as a travel warning. If you check the website of the State Department today, you will see an example of their travel warnings at the top of every page. The reason why some people get confused is because the travel advisory system replaced the system of travel warnings that had existed until the end of 2017. But more on this later. The United States is believed to be the first government on record to ever issue a travel warning. It happened in 1914 and it was advising Americans against traveling to Europe because of the First World War. There were more warnings to follow, but the actual structured travel warning program was launched much later, in 1978. Initially aiming warnings at airlines and travel companies, while the general public would only have access to them if they accidentally happened to look at a passport center bulletin board. So the original system was not that efficient, and the first time it seriously failed was in 1988. On the 20th of December, the US Department of State made a new telephone hotline available using a touchtone menu US citizen travelers could listen to a recording to learn whether or not there was a warning about travel to a given country. But the problem was not what that travel advisory said, but rather what it didn't say. US government knew about the potential terrorist attack and the alert regarding an anonymous but credible threat to a Pan Am flight was sent to several embassies, airports and airlines, but not to the general public, and the consequences were severe. The next day, Pan Am flight 103 exploded while en route from London to New York City, killing all the people on board and 11 on the ground in Scotland where it crashed. This tragic event was the reason why travel advisories became such a serious thing for the US government. And this is when a more robust travel advice system was implemented, including country profiles, travel warnings and public announcements, which were later renamed as travel alerts. In 1990, the Congress passed a law where they added a requirement to the government to develop guidelines for issuing notification to the public of threats to civil aviation. And then they created the No Double Standard policy, which meant whatever applied in the context of aviation should also be done for all other non-aviation contexts. This is when it became obligatory by law for the US State Department to issue and update travel warnings and announcements on a regular basis 
which later evolved into the system of travel advisories we have today. As you can see, the original idea behind the US travel advisories is indeed all about safety and security of American citizens. And it's not like they declare this because of some moral or ethical interest of keeping their citizens alive and well. It is also for practical reasons. In other words, prevention is better than cure. For instance, the State Department was responsible for evacuating approximately 15,000 Americans from Lebanon during the summer of 2006 when the war broke out in that region. Imagine the cost for the government to do that. Originally, travel warnings were issued for serious things like a war or civil unrest, while public announcements or later travel alerts were issued for short-term events, for instance in case of a hurricane. A designated page with a country profile gave an extensive description with a lot of useful information about visa requirements, security, health, transportation, everything placed in sections. It was like a little booklet for a country. In January 2018, a brand new format of US travel advisories was launched, which introduced four levels and several risk indicators. The levels allow travelers to see right away if a country is at level 1, that is reasonably safe, and to level 4 when it says do not travel, so people see right away there is some risk. There is also a category other, currently including three countries. But if you look at the actual travel advisory and color coding, it's clear that Israel and China are at level 3, while Mexico is at level 2. The indicators show why a certain level is assigned, like C for crime, H for health risks, and so on. Travel advisories can be reviewed and updated as often as needed, but at minimum once every year for level 1 and 2, and once every 6 months for levels 3 and 4. What many people might not realize is that overall level of a travel advisory can be different from the level for each of the indicators. For instance, this is where the travel advisory is shown overall level 4, but it's because of health, while crime is at level 2. There might also be separate notes as to different locations within the same country. So even if the overall advisory is at level 2, some locations may say level 4, do not travel. It is important to also note that each travel advisory would have a link to the full country profile and recommendations to read it. And guess what? It's the country profile you should read as a priority because that's where all the important information is, while the travel advisory, especially for some countries, can be quite brief. There is also an option to enroll into a smart traveler enrollment program to receive alerts to make it easier in case of emergency. But keep in mind, you'd be sharing every single step with the government and the program is abbreviated as step, so yeah. However, despite all these good things about travel advisories, when reading them, you should also be aware of the various issues. There is a very interesting research done by Dr. Levenheim called The Responsibility to Responsibilize, published in the International Political Sociology. And he proved that travel warnings are often issued by the government out of fear of being sued for negligence, for not warning the citizens about the risks of travel to certain parts of the world. And this is issue number one, because the goal behind this is to protect the government as a priority, not the citizens. This is why we see phrases like the US government doesn't pay any bills, you should have your own insurance and so on. But the main problem is that it goes much further than this. The State Department often exaggerates information about every country. They include things that are not really happening in this country or not relevant. Or maybe there was one odd incident, but they put it in there just in case so they can point at it and say, well, you know, we told you. The goal is to shift the full responsibility on the traveler, and that's why there are statements like terrorism threat in Norway or the recent update of the travel advisory for the Bahamas that now features a threat of shark attacks, making it look as if it's something that happens all the time even though shark attacks are extremely rare. You might think that's fine, people should be on alert just in case. 
But it's not that simple because it leads to issue number two, the boy who cried wolf. If they're warning you about a crime risk in two countries, but one is potential and doesn't really affect any tourists like Jamaica, and the other one is very real, I'm not going to name any countries, how would you know which one is which? And if they keep telling you, reconsider travel to Jamaica due to crime, dangerous, woof, woof, and you still go there, and there is no woof, everything is beautiful, and you have a fantastic trip, so of course you're not going to take the travel advisory seriously next time, are you? And next time the risk might be very real. And it's a major issue with travel advisory because it does exactly the opposite of what's intended. It directly puts your health and life at risk because they're confusing you when crying wolf when there isn't one and crying wolf when there is one. But in this case, they're not the boy, you are. And the reminder, the only reason why the State Department does that is to protect themselves. So they won't have to take any responsibility for you if something does happen. The situation might get worse because of the vague language they use. And this is issue number three. They would say things like common, usually, often, frequently. Regardless of whether it is indeed common or if it hardly ever happens. And you have no way of knowing that unless you go and try to find some statistics. Because travel advisories don't include any data. Instead, they tend to take things out of context and focus on random issues one person might have encountered some time ago and then generalize them while totally missing the bigger picture. In short, quite often they give you advice that is totally relevant, while they do not give you advice that you might actually need in that country. Here's a good example from the travel advisory for Jamaica. Local police often do not respond effectively to serious criminal incidents. When arrests are made, cases are infrequently prosecuted to a conclusive sentence. What is often? One time out of ten? Out of a hundred? What is not effectively? The police come late, don't come at all. What is a serious criminal incident? Violent crime like homicide? What about theft? Is it serious enough? And what is infrequently? Again, one time out of 10 or out of 1,000? What do they want me to do with this information? Are they telling me that I should not call the police if I need to? Or are they saying, I should call the police, but only if it's not a serious criminal incident. For the serious one, should I call the US Embassy instead of the police? Do you see the problem with this, right? But wait, what this travel advisory is actually claiming is if Americans come to Jamaica and decide to commit all sorts of crimes, most likely they will get away with it. Police don't respond, cases not prosecuted. Is that the advice they want to give me? Is like, you know, break the law, you'll be fine. And just to be clear, this information is incorrect. The police does respond in Jamaica and the cases are prosecuted to a conclusive sentence. In reality, what these two sentences are really saying is that the State Department is not responsible for the work of the local police force. If something happens, that's not our problem. And if you're unhappy about the work of the local police, well, we warned you. And if the government of the host country questions, why are you saying these things about our police? Well, we said often, doesn't mean always. You see, vague language. Professional diplomats, they can push whatever agenda while pretending they're not really saying anything, are they? And this brings us to issue number four, politics. The State Department website is not a travel agency website, not a trip advisor. It's a website of the government of the most influential country in the world right now. Whether you like the United States or not, but it has the largest economy, powerful military, and an incredibly wide media outreach. So if they decide, if, I'm not implying they're doing this, 
if they decide to use travel advisories or travel warnings as a political leverage, for instance, to propose a tourism-dependent country to do things this country doesn't really want to do, how can this country possibly resist such a generous offer? The US government website clearly states that they do not use travel advisories as a political tool. And honestly, it would have been strange if they said otherwise. But the fact this statement exists on their website raises a question. Was someone saying you did? And the answer is yes, there was. Several researchers were looking into this issue. For example, there was a case study for Kenya, where they analyzed the treatment of language in travel advisories and how it was used as a tool of political sanction. Probably the most studied case is the treatment of the Gambia by the British government, not American. The publication is called Travel Advisor or Trade Embargo, and it explains to what extent the dependency on tourism can be used as a political bargaining tool. Already mentioned, Dr. Levenheim analyzed different cases and concluded that some official travel advice is believed to serve as a means of soft sanctions in which one country would punish another one by using travel warnings to prevent the flow of tourism dollars until this country agrees. All of this should serve as a good example to Caribbean nations such as Jamaica to be prepared that sometimes, well actually at any time, innocent things like travel advisories can be used against them. And of course the general public should be aware of this issue when they're planning a trip and suddenly hear this massive media coverage of a travel advisory. A recent case of such situation we've just witnessed when an entire US media force was unleashed to spread misinformation about the Bahamas and Jamaica. And this is issue number four media coverage of travel advisories. Please feel free to watch my other video where I expose all the details of how that media campaign was orchestrated. Basically, they lied. They claimed that crime increased when it actually decreased. The level of a travel advisor was escalated when it actually wasn't. Obviously, the official institutions also recognize this problem, not just some random YouTubers like me. In 2005, the United Nations World Tourism Organization adopted a resolution that prescribed guidelines on travel advisories, addressing procedures used when formulating and administrating things like travel warnings. It also gives guidelines how the media should cover the travel advisories. And what has recently happened in January and February 2024 with the media coverage of the Bahamas and Jamaica directly breaks these guidelines. Obviously the governments know what to do about that, but I just thought the general public might want to know that. Travel advisories are extremely biased at every possible level, from what they are saying, how they are saying it, and who they are saying it about. Remember when all countries were viewed as kind of three categories, first world countries, second world and third world countries? Today they are viewed in five categories apparently. First world countries are now in category one. The former second world countries are now called in transition and placed in categories two and three depending on whether they are democracies or not. And the former third world countries are now called developing and are also divided into two subcategories. Note, this division doesn't depend on whether this country is rich or not. From this perspective, China is a developing country, even though its economy is the second largest in the world. The reason I'm sharing this information in this video is because of how the information is written in travel advisories directly depends on the category of a country. And this is because of the bias of the United States government. Basically, they will write exactly the same thing, but use different language for it. If it's a category one country, they will describe it as if there is really nothing to worry about and keep it in the country profile page, not in the advisory, not to scare you, but it still, you know, should be somewhere in case something does happen. So you won't blame them. 
If, however, it's a category four or five country, they will describe exactly the same situation by using a much harsher language, making it sound scary. And they will pull it out from the country profile and stick it into a travel advisory so it's right in your face. Let me show you a few general and some specific examples. Category one countries rarely include direct advice, such as do not do something. Instead, they have have be advised, be alert to surroundings, be aware of the situation. But for developing countries in categories four and five, they will have way more direct language. Do not display, do not carry, do not attempt. So for the same warning about crime, for instance, you would have be aware of potential criminal activities, be alert to potential crime versus do not resist or antagonize criminals, violent crimes such as home invasions, armed robbery, sexual assault and homicides are common. How common are they in category one countries? Well, they never say. This biased language is applied even when you would least expect it. For instance, here is the section for health information in Jamaica, the category four country, and the same health section for Iceland, category one country. The Icelandic medical system offers coverage only for people who live in Iceland. The same applies in Jamaica, but they don't mention that. Instead, public hospitals are under-resourced and cannot always provide high level or specialized care. Private hospitals require payment upfront before admitting patients. The same information in Iceland? Non-residents are expected to pay their own medical costs, and you should be prepared to pay your bill in full before leaving the hospital or clinic. This is the same information. Healthcare is free for the locals, but foreigners have to pay. But they make it sound very different. In case of Iceland, look at how great the medical services are for their people, but we are foreigners, so sure, we have to pay. Whereas with Jamaica, they don't mention that the healthcare is free for the locals. Instead of saying that Jamaica's hospitals can provide high level or specialized care in most cases, they say cannot always provide high level or specialized care. And private hospitals require payment upfront. Who do they think they are? Let me read another example in neutral tone and see if you can guess which one is Iceland and which one is Jamaica. U.S. citizens with medical emergencies can face bills in the tens of thousands of dollars with air ambulance service to the United States in the range of 30,000 to 50,000 USD. This country does have air ambulance services, but they are limited by weather and distance to the patient. Patients bear all costs for transfer to or between hospitals if the patient is not a permanent resident or citizen of this country. The last one was for Iceland. I find it fascinating. And by the way, I'm not picking on Iceland or anything. I love Iceland. It's just that it's an island, category one country, and there might be risks to health because of the weather, especially if you are in a remote location. But the country profile is playing down these risks and the travel advisory is literally saying nothing. Anyway, there was a full study of different biases and all sorts of other things about travel warnings. For instance, by Ryan Larson, he did this for his PhD and studied all the travel warnings and alerts from 1994 to 2014. And his findings when it comes to the language were that there is a clear relationship between the country category and the language used. But it gets more harsh as it moves to category five. But it's not only the language. He also performed a chi-square test. And what he discovered is that category one countries hardly ever had any travel warnings or alerts, even when there should have been some. So it's not so much the discrimination of of the category four and five countries, but rather preferential treatment of category one countries. For instance, there was not even a single travel alert for Ireland, Northern Ireland, and the rest of the UK in the 1990s to inform travelers about the risks, you know, related to the violence because of the IRA. The same goes for Spain and bombings by the so-called Basque separatists throughout the years. 
In summer 2016, after three successive mass killings in France, there was not and had not been even a single travel alert for France, let alone a travel warning. I'm not sure if these reports by scientists made the US government realize that there is something wrong with this travel warning system and change it to the new travel advisory system we have today. To be fair, during COVID, country category didn't really matter anymore. Most were at level four, do not travel. However, the biased language is still very much there, waiting to be changed. The last and probably the most important issue with travel advisories is when they don't work as intended. And instead of protecting US citizens, they put their health or even life under unnecessary risk. Apart from the cry wolf situation mentioned earlier, another important point is that the State Department doesn't publish travel advisories for the United States of America. The reason why this is such a serious issue is because when Americans are planning their vacation and they hear these travel advisories to reconsider travel, they not go, oh, all right then, no vacation, back to work. No, they choose a different destination. And the choice is not only between the Bahamas and Jamaica, they choose between Jamaica and California or the Bahamas and Florida. Earlier, I brought up an example of the travel advisory for the Bahamas that featured a warning for shark attacks. But because they added this information with no context or any data, it might have led Americans into making a very wrong decision. What if because of that travel advisory and the new warning about the sharks, an American citizen cancels the trip to the Bahamas and goes to Florida instead and gets attacked by a shark? Is the US government going to take responsibility for placing the health of this person at risk? Looks like the answer is no, because the State Department's priority is the safety and security of American citizens overseas. So does this mean that the safety and security of Americans back in the US is not a priority for the State Department? And if it is, then why isn't there a travel advisory for every single state of America? Especially considering the scale of the domestic tourism in the United States. What if after hearing this huge media campaign to reconsider travel to Jamaica in February 2024, some Americans really reconsidered and instead of a Jamaican resort, they went somewhere else, let's say a Super Bowl parade. You see, what the State Department is doing with these travel advisories, especially when it says reconsider travel or do not travel, they push Americans into an alternative choice, which in turn might put them at an unnecessary risk. But are they going to be compensated for this misguidance? I don't think so. I'm not even sure if Americans can be compensated if they follow travel advisory directly and as a result encounter damages. Well, with so much misinformation and vague language until this is fixed, here's a hypothetical situation. Let's say there is an American lady on a vacation on a Caribbean island, hypothetically, and she begins experiencing some mental health issues, unfortunately. She has a choice. Either she goes to a local doctor and gets help before flying back home, or she waits until she gets back to the United States and then gets medical help. She opens the State Department's travel advisory and country profile for this Caribbean country and finds the following. Health facilities may be below US standards, especially when it comes to mental health care. Public medical clinics lack basic resources and supplies. Private hospitals and doctors require payment up front prior to service or admission. She listens to the State Department and decides to risk her health and fly to the US in her current condition. But unfortunately, before leaving the country, as she goes through the airport security, she has a serious mental breakdown tries to attack other people, gets arrested, somebody's filming her, the footage goes viral, she loses a job, total disaster. And here's an important part. She does get medical help in the end in that Caribbean country, and it turns out 
that the healthcare is actually pretty good. So all she had to do was to seek medical help before flying back home. But because the travel advisory provided her with misinformation and made her believe that the medical services were bad, she made a wrong decision and ended up losing everything. So in this case, should the State Department compensate this person? I don't know. It's a hypothetical situation. But what do you think? The law of unintended consequences suggests that actions of people, especially of governments, always have effects that are unanticipated or unintended. Issuing travel advisories is certainly one of such actions. Running a full-scale media campaign with fake information about Jamaica is also one of those actions. If not for that campaign, I would have never spent one month of my life investigating the subject of travel advisories. And I don't know if it's a good thing I did. You see, it's very easy to be patriotic about some country and declare how much I love Jamaica, you know. That is, if you're not risking anything. But honestly, I have no idea of the unintended consequences, in my case, because of making these two videos, highlighting the issues with the US government travel advisory system. It's just exactly the same as debunking some YouTube bloggers, if you see what I mean. Will I ever be able to get US visa because of this? Maybe US embassy people watch this and decide to put this journalist in some, you know, never go list. Or maybe these videos get blocked or channel gets banned. Or maybe it will have some positive effects, like the people from the State Department watch it and think, well, maybe we should move forward with fixing some of the issues mentioned. In any case, the priority of this video is to be useful for my audience. Now and any time in future, if you ever hear the news about travel advisories again, you know there is a video here that you can send to your friends or your relatives or your guests. I'd like to give special thanks to our patrons. I'm not featuring your names in these travel advisory videos because they can be viewed as political, but I am super grateful for all of your support. I do see it and I do appreciate it. So thank you so much once again. And everyone else watching this video who also wants to support our channel, you can do so on Patreon from only five US dollars a month. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.